Proceedings 101, our first cross-training session of 2021, and we are honored to have Chief Justice Evan Jenkins with us today in honor of the fact that this is our first cross-training of 2021 and the first one since the pandemic uh, hit us last year. So thank you, Chief, for being with us today. The topic thank you. Is the topic today is referrals, investigations, petitions, and preliminary hearings. My name is Kristen Antolini. I'm a guardian ad litem in North Central West Virginia, and I will be your moderator today. We are privileged to have seasoned colleagues join us today to walk us through the preliminary stages of an abuse and neglect proceedings. Our speakers are Rebecca Carson, Director of Centralized Intake, Isabella Loretta, Senior CPS Investigator for Berkeley, Morgan and Jefferson counties and attorney Teresa Lyons counsel for the court improvement program and a warm thank you to our speakers for sharing this time with us today. Before we get started and hear from it, the chief, just a few housekeeping items for our attorneys. Today's presentation provides 1 hour of CLE credit. The provider is the Supreme Court of Appeals in West Virginia. For our social workers, today's presentation provides 1 hour of CEU credit. Everyone will be able to find the CLE and the CEU code at the end of our online survey. Candy will be kind enough to put that link in the chat box um, during today's presentation. And also you will be receiving an email both with the link to the survey that has those codes that you need along with a copy of our PowerPoint from today's presentation. And we truly appreciate your feedback in our surveys as it assists us in planning future events. Our next back to basic seminar will be on Friday, April 16th at noon. The topic is adjudication and improvement periods. Our speakers will be Natalie Saul and Teresa Lyon. We ask for your kind patience today if we encounter any technological problems as we are streaming from multiple counties all across the mountain state. And if you are a panelist, we ask that you mute your line if you are not speaking. Um, and we encourage everyone today to utilize the chat function, both to ask questions to our panelists, to our colleagues, and to share information resources. I think some of our best learning during these online sessions that we have is, has really come out of the chat session. So please utilize that today, today to connect with each other. And finally, just note that our session today is being recorded. And again, due to the fact that this is our first cross training of 2021, we are honored to welcome Chief Justice Evan Jenkins to welcome everyone today. Thank you for joining us, Chief, and the floor is yours. Well, Kristen, thank you so much, and it's great to be with you. I'm not sure if the others heard in our little uh, brief moment before we signed on, we have over 260 people participating today. So uh, I will tell you that's simply overwhelming. And thanks to each and every one of you. I joined the court about three years ago. And while this program is called uh, the, uh, uh, the cross training program uh, uh, for uh, uh, 101, uh, let me give you a number uh, that's also pretty powerful. And that is 41, 41% of the cases that uh, we heard last year uh, involved abuse and neglect in family matters. Uh, and the uh, abuse and neglect was the vast majority of the domestic cases. Uh, so 41%, let that sink in for just a moment. And remember, we are an appeal by right state, meaning we take all appeals. This isn't just that we uh, selected out of all the appeals uh, such a significant number of abuse and neglect. Uh, that is a number of all of the appeals uh, uh, to us. So that tells you a little bit about the docket that the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals and the types of cases we are considering. Uh, so abuse and neglect procedure 101, absolutely essential. What the Supreme Court hears uh, are some of the most challenging situations and circumstances that our children find themselves in. 
There are many stories uh, that warm our heart of success where permanency for a child has uh, uh, been uh, situated, giving uh, a, a child hope for the future out of a very difficult, challenging circumstances. We have opportunities uh, where children are able to go back in their homes and that uh, parents have gotten the, the support that they need and we have real success stories. Uh, but we also know every step along the way is a possibility procedurally that something gets off track. And that's usually what we are seeing at the Supreme Court is where something in the process along this very complex road in the abuse and neglect procedures, uh, something has happened, uh, something is, as I say, got off track, and we are reviewing that at the Supreme Court level. Well, uh, that's why this program, uh, uh, the Basics 101, this session and the two to follow are so important. So many stakeholders, each and every one of you have an important role in this process to make sure it goes as the, the law uh, provides and making sure that, again, we are always thinking about the best interest of the child. So thanks for your participation today. Thanks uh, to you for what you do in your everyday lives and the important role that you play in uh, helping and supporting uh, the youth of our state, uh, making sure that they have a brighter future. So Cindy, to your team uh, for the Court Improvement Program, thank you for all you do, the panelists today. I appreciate your participation. And again, most of all, to the almost 300 people who have signed on today uh, who say uh, we do want to learn more and to uh, make sure that we follow uh, the processes and procedures uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we achieve the best results uh, for our children in West Virginia. So have a great program and thanks so much. Thank you, Chief. Now we're going to move on now to the first part of our program, which is going to be talking about referrals. And we're going to talk about mandatory reporting and centralized intake with Rebecca Carson. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's just get right to it. Tell us what is centralized intake? Uh, centralized intake is a statewide unit. Um, comprised of about 40 licensed social workers and 11 supervisor CPS supervisors um, who form a central point of contact where all abuse and neglect reports can be um, made, entered into our database, screened by those supervisors, and then assigned to local offices as needed. And when you are getting uh, reports in, you're getting a lot in from mandatory reporters, of course. Can you tell folks exactly what a mandatory reporter is and and how many of the folks on the line today are in fact a mandatory reporter yeah i can um the west virginia code uh specifies this in chapter 49 and and you have a slide there reminding you it's 49 to 803 which i'm sure many of you already know um mandated reporters are selected and identified because they are people who have regular contact with our vulnerable populations we're talking today about specifically child abuse, but uh, mandated reporting also rolls over into our adult population, our vulnerable adult population. Um, because of the roles uh, these people have and the frequency of contact they have with our vulnerable people, they are required by law to report things that they reasonably suspect to be abuse or neglect. Um, th there's an entire list uh, at Chapter 49, in Chapter 49, 2803, that includes um, Everybody that West Virginia identifies as a mandated reporter. Um, you want me to read that or do you want just to make reference to or is that sufficient? Making, re making reference is sufficient. I appreciate it. Okay. Rebecca. I, I think with the audience, they would be well aware. And then can you tell us a little bit about how the centralized intake process work after someone has made a referral to your office? I, I can't. Sure. So you call into the 1-800 number, which is provided throughout this um, slideshow. And if you're reporting child abuse, you would select option two, which would get your child abuse call answered um, quicker than if you select another option that is not that is not the correct avenue. So, so be mindful of your options there. Um, that call comes in and is sent to our next available worker, and they begin immediately collecting information and entering it into our database. Our database is called FACTS, F-A-C-T-S, for the Children and Families, Family and Children Tracking System. 
Um, so we're entering that as we're speaking to the caller. So their information is ti timely and is accurate per what they are saying. And if any of those workers are on a call that they identify to be an imminent danger situation or in the department's terminology, a present danger situation, um, they notify a supervisor immediately so that they can begin some communication at our site with um, expediting the response to that. So I'll just go down that track first on the left side of the handout is an imminent or present danger situation. The alert, we have supervisors designated here every day um, with that job to pay attention to those referrals and, and expedite those. So they notify one of our, um, we call them ER for more emergency response situations. They notify one of our ER supervisors and they begin helping them through the process and perhaps even notifying the local office um, during the workday if this situation is going to be assigned to them so that they can be aware even before the paper or the digital file reaches them. Um, if it is screened out, which typically present dangers or immediate responses don't reach that screen out level, they are uh, you know, emergent by nature. Um, but if it is screened out because that family is already working with that, or I'm sorry, because that county is already working with that family, then we would notify them that, hey, this is coming in. It's a duplicate to what you're already working on. It has some new information. Please be aware because that referral would be screened out and not technically assigned to their um, county, but it is still in our database for their review. Um, on all referrals accepted or screened out, emergent or routine, centralized intake is sending a mandated reporter notification letter of that screening decision to the mandated reporter. We send those through a clerical unit so that we track them on a spreadsheet. And if they are returned for insufficient address or some other reason, we have a record of that. And uh, we can resend that if, if the person calls back and, and provides us with a different address. So um, when the call comes in and it is a routine uh, CPS report or APS, uh, we follow that same process, only the supervisor is not immediately involved. The, the worker finishes that report, enters it into the database, and sends it to our supervisor box. And all available and scheduled CI supervisors are screening the, the next available report so that we can get those out of here very timely as well. So they are um, applying the West Virginia code definitions to abuse and neglect to make sure that the information provided rises to that standard um, so that we protect our, obviously protect our families' rights and, and protect, um, you know, our, our agency as well. So they have to meet the legal standard of, of the West Virginia Code. So if we accept that, it does meet the standard. We, um, at Centralized Intake, one of those supervisors assigns the response time that is appropriate based on the information provided and sends that to the local office to be um, assigned to a worker there with the response time that we have designated. Um, if we screen that out here due to being a duplicate of a, of a situation that the local office is already uh, addressing, we notify them again that a new referral involving a family they are working with with, uh, with the same allegations has been received and screened out and we provide them that info, the, you know, the case number so they can review that. If the, if the referral that is um, received on a family that is already receiving services has new allegations or um, a new situation or incident has arisen since the last one, we would still accept that and send that to them as uh, we only accept a duplicate when it is a true duplicate of the of the allegations that were previously provided. So there's a couple of nuances there. Um, if we screen that out for not meeting the definition of abuse or neglect, uh, we don't notify the local office that goes into our database and they're able to review that when, when they do a search on subsequent or existing re referrals, but um, that's that the local office would have to look for that referral in that situation. Again, we send those reporter letters identifying whether it was accepted or not. And that is primarily the only information that uh, the reporter is entitled to from centralized intake. Later on in the process, they're entitled to additional information. Thank you. And if you are calling in a referral, what kind of information um, are you looking for at centralized intake? What what does the reporter need to give your office? Um, well, we, we train all of our workers here in the same CPS. Um, they, they receive the same training that our CPS workers do. So they are doing basically a quick um, 
investigation of what you're calling about. So they're going to ask you and hopefully guide you through the, the interview to get all of the demographic information about the household that you have. Um, and it's imperative to us to ask if you know of any safety concerns to a first responder that would go there. Those are some of the first questions that you will be asked. So we can start this referral in the name of the, of the child victim and the perpetrator, as well as identify any immediate safety concerns. Um, we will also ask about the location of those people now, uh, if they have access to them, if the maltreater has access to the child, uh, those kind of questions obviously help us determine our response time. If this does meet definition, how quickly do we need to get a worker out there? Um, most of you, I'm sure, know that West Virginia Code has a couple of different um, options up to and including zero to 14 days. So uh, we only use that typically in, in low risk educational neglect kind of situations or or when the child is like safety safely in an out of state treatment facility or something. But but there are different time frames that can be assigned. So the information about that access is also very important. And then we're going to ask for uh, a detailed as, as much detail as you have about the incident or um, suspected abuse or neglect that you're calling about. Uh, we need kind of a description of injuries if they exist. We have when you believe they occurred or when was the last time you saw them. Just some information that will help us identify um, and piece together the cause and effect of those injuries and, and whether the standard of reasonable cause to suspect is, is all filled in. Um, you're obviously also going to be asked for mandated reporter information so that we can provide that letter to you and, the, and that goes on through through the case as they're entitled to different information later. So we should be asking, I hope so, about the incident, everybody in that household, the access, any safety concerns that you have or dangers to anybody involved. And um, we also specifically ask about substance abuse, domestic violence, um, as those contribute more to abuse neglect and to a more volatile situation. So those questions are always coming up. Now, one of the main questions I get in this is if I don't know, you know, um, you know, what do I do? And that's perfectly fine. We're going to ask you anyway, because sometimes you don't know what you know until someone delves a little bit into your information and you may have information that you didn't even realize was relevant. So it's fine to say, I don't know that um, a lot of people get frustrated because we still try to ask some of those questions. But again, sometimes it it brings out a, a very relevant piece of information that the person didn't even realize they had. So uh, we will still enter a report if you don't know. We will still enter a report without an address or, or any of that information. We do need an estimated age if you don't know a date of birth. There are some demographics that um, you know we have to at least make a guess on so that we can uh, make some of our decisions. But uh, not knowing uh, the details and the specifics is not a reason not to report. And as director of centralized intake, just in general, about how many referrals um, is the department receiving per year or per month? I mean, just give us an idea of the volume that's coming into centralized intake on a regular basis. Um, a lot, <laughs> as as the chief justice said, it's it's a big part of uh, of society right now. I would say. I didn't look this up ahead of time, so I'm just going from my previous monthly report, but. Um, probably 3,500 to 5,000 would be normal during um, a typical school year, school day, when our mandated reporters have extensive contact with uh, within the school system. That's been a little lower during uh, the pandemic, uh, still within 2,500 to 3,500, 4,000 range. I'm, and that's guessing I have all that data. Um, I just didn't prepare it. So sorry about that. Um, but it's quite a lot, uh, as I said before, we have 40 staff here that work 24 hours. I didn't say that. We have 24 7, 365 coverage with 40 full time workers. So, um, you know, that's a lot of volume for, for that many people. And we take about 120,000 phone calls uh, because many people call here with other, other issues and other situations that don't result in referral. So um, it's quite busy here. Absolutely. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us. We really appreciate um, you sharing about centralized intake with us. And thank you for your work you do as director of centralized intake. You're welcome. Thanks.
Next up, we have Isabella uh, Loretta, who is a senior investigator in Berkeley, Morgan, and Jefferson counties. And she is going to talk with us about what her duties as an investigator for the department are and what happens um, after CPS actually receives um, a referral that has been screened in from centralized intake. Welcome, Bella. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So can you tell us just a little bit about what are your duties as a senior investigator for the department? So as a senior worker, um, I am still conducting investigations uh, for the referrals that Rebecca Carson was just speaking about. Um, I also assist other workers um, with their investigations as well, um, but I do typically carry a full caseload myself. Um, so essentially, once the referral is screened in by centralized intake, from there, then it's sent to the counties. Um, and then the, the county supervisor has access to the inbox, and from there, it's assigned to a worker. So as a worker, if I am assigned a referral, one of the first things that we always do um, is complete a fact search. And that is a computer database that we use. Um, and that's to determine if we have any important history with the family, if we currently have an open case with the family. Um, you can typically glean a lot of information um, in doing those record searches. Uh, and we always try to do that before we go out on the referral if possible. Uh, from there, uh, after a fact search is conducted, our first contact is with the child, the alleged victim in the referral. Um, and we, we interview that child, and then we interview other children. If, they, if there's other children in the home, we speak with any non-offending parents, any offending parents, um, and we get collateral information as well. So collaterals could be references for the family, it could be anyone outside of the family who has any information about the allegations themselves, uh, including law enforcement, um, a doctor, uh, a teacher, things like that. Um, throughout this whole process, um, we are assessing for the child's safety as well as gathering information. Um, sometimes this includes getting records from the courthouse or getting um, CAD records if there's been law enforcement involvement. Um, it could include having a child see a forensic nurse um, for documentation of any injuries. Um, that is certainly important if there are present injuries that we make sure that they are documented and um, that they're seen by medical staff just to make sure that there is nothing else going on uh, that we don't know about and that way they can be treated for whatever condition is going on. Um, after all of the information is gathered is whenever we as the department make a decision about kind of where we go from here. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're always assessing for safety. So we are looking at the allegations themselves, uh, whatever was specifically called into the hotline, but we're also trying to get a better big picture of how this family functions and if there are any safety concerns outside of those specific allegations in our referral. Um, so we're always looking for present danger. Um, which would require an, an immediate response, much like Rebecca Carson said, but we're also looking for what's called impending danger. And that is any sort of negative family condition um, that is uncontrolled and that could affect the child's safety. Sometimes we figure that out immediately. Sometimes we figure that out after we get a lot of information. Um, but that is really important in figuring out kind of where we go from here. Um, if there's no safety concerns, if we have no present or impending dangers, and if the allegations are not substantiated, then a, an assessment is closed out. Um, if there are impending dangers, we take that next step into figuring out, okay, how can we control these impending dangers as they exist to make sure that we can keep children safe in the home? Um, so, Bella, what are our options when we're looking at putting some services into the home or, or the removal? Um, do you have an option for in-home safety plans? Do you have an option for temporary protection plans? Um, what, are you, what are your options as a department worker? As the department worker, we do have a few options. So, we have a temporary protection plan uh, lasts up to seven days. Um, and that is to figure out the, the safety of the children right now. Uh, oftentimes that's to give us 
time to conduct our investigation with um, interviewing other children, other household members. In the meantime, we need to make sure that the children are safe while we do that, while we get the rest of the information and figure out exactly what's going on. Um, the, a temporary protection plan can be put in place and at the end of the seven days, um, it's determined that it's gonna be closed out. Um, or on the other side, um, we have safety plans and we have two kinds of safety plans. And we have in-home and out-of-home safety plans. So those um, each last quite a bit longer than the temporary protection plan. They last for 90 days um, and they can certainly be renewed or readjusted um, as needed. So uh, to, before we figure out if we're doing an in-home safety plan or an out-of-home safety plan, we conduct what is called the safety analysis. And that is five questions that we go through as the CPS worker to determine is this, can we make sure these kids are safe in the home? Do we have services to keep the kids in the home and make sure that they're safe? Does the family have a home? Is the family willing to keep the children in the home? So we go through those questions. Um, if all of those questions check yes, uh, then we utilize an in-home safety plan. So that could include informal resources and formal resources. Uh, informal resources could be as simple as um, a neighbor coming over to help out when the kids aren't in school or a relative taking the kids uh, on the weekend. Um, and we really, really try and utilize those informal resources to keep the kids with their family um, as much as possible. Because um, families, there's certainly plenty of support that we want to take advantage of. Um, we also have more formal resources uh, to assist in that as needed, and that could be supervision, it could be crisis intervention, um, and I know that each each region is different in terms of uh, what sort of resources they have uh, for safety, more formal safety services like that. Um, so, and is sometimes is it difficult to put an in-home safety plan in place due to the resources that you have available at the time? I mean, that's the reality of of the system that we're all working together in, correct? Absolutely. It, it is not uncommon for in-home safety plans to not be an option just because we don't have those resources available, whether informal or formal. However, if someone wants to learn more about, you know, what actually consists of an in-home safety plan, I think the best place to look is the actual department CPS policy um, dated January 2021. That kind of outlines, and I have that on the screen for folks, you know, what an in-home safety plan must consist of. And I think that these are important, and I would like to get your feedback on this, Bella, because this really helps our children stay in their homes, and that's always the department's um, number one um, kind of goal is if children can be safe in their home, we want the children to stay with their families. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. And is the temporary protection plan, can you walk us through a little bit kind of just what this looks like? I mean, this is actually an agreement between the parent or the caregiver and the department, correct? Yes, it is. Um, it is a voluntary agreement, so it's not a court order. Um, and like I said, it lasts up to seven days. So each box on um, on our temporary protection plan is important and serves its own purpose. Um, first, we identify what the potential impending danger is or what the concern is. It may be related to um, the, the parenting skills. It may be related to drug use in the home, domestic violence in the home. Um, there's a variety of dangers that we are assessing for. Um, the next part is identifying those safety resources. And for the most part on our temporary protection plans, these are typically informal safety resources. These are the family members, the neighbors, the teachers, um, anyone who can help out in that short seven day window. Um, and then, uh, the next part is kind of what we are doing as the CPS worker throughout the protection plan. So anytime that we implement a protection plan, we oftentimes still have a whole lot of information to gather. We may still need to talk with other people. Uh, we may need to complete documentation. Sometimes we have enough information as is to determine that, you know, we need to take this next step. We need to, in, you know, have some court oversight into this case um, to ensure that these kids are safe. Um, and this protection plan gives us seven days to do just that. 
Oh, you're muted, Kristen. Thank you. If all else fails, then you may have to seek an application for ratification of emergency custody, correct? Correct. And I have put on, I'm going to put on the screen exactly what that application looks like. Can you just briefly tell us just, you know, in, in a concise as you can, just what that process is like and what you have to do as a department worker to make that happen? Yes. Uh, so this is the application for ratification of emergency custody. There's also um, a court order that goes along with this. Uh, but essentially, these are the forms that we use as CPS workers whenever we determine that these children are in imminent danger, that there is some sort of emergency situation that exists that is affecting that the, these children's safety, and we need to do something about it immediately. Um, we fill out uh, the top part of the information with whatever um, information about the family that we have, um, and then the form kind of walks you through um, the information that the judge or the magistrate needs before making a determination about whether or not the department can uh, seek emergency custody. Um, so one of the things is going through, um, like I said, the imminent danger, and there are um, some some like statutory examples of imminent danger. Um, it could be drug use of parenting. It could be non-accidental trauma. Um, but there's also a catch-all or other emergency situation, and it's not uncommon uh, for us to have that box filled out. And then there's and the portion under that is where we uh, go into a little bit more detail about exactly what is going on and exactly exactly what leads the department to believe that imminent danger exists for these children. Um, the next part is um, about reasonable efforts. So uh, that is to see if the department has made reasonable efforts to prevent this removal. We don't always have time to make reasonable efforts, so um, there are times where we need to act immediately. It is such an emergent situation. Um, there are also times where we have aggravated circumstances, um, and in those situations, the department is not obligated to make reasonable efforts. Those would be situations uh, related to um, any sort of murder, attempted murder, sexual abuse, um, if a parent has a prior involuntary termination. Uh, those are all things that are important in determining whether or not the department needs to make reasonable efforts to prevent the removal. And then you have to outline those emergency services, correct? And then you also have to outline where the child has resided um, and who the children has lived with, if you know, in the last five years, correct? Correct. And, and then you take that petition um, to the judge or to the magistrate, um, whoever um, you have to go to in your particular county on an emergency basis to have that sign, right? Yes. All right. Um, and is there anything else that you want to share with folks about, you know, the importance of an investigation or the work that you do with Child Protective Services? Um, I don't think so. I think most of um, the people who are in this training have um, a solid idea of how we work, how we function, um, and they probably have a pretty good idea of, of what I've been talking about so far. Excellent. So we have a few um, questions that um, have been coming in or in the chat, and some of them have come privately to me and some have come to everybody. Bella, if you don't mind, if you can hang on while Teresa is talking and kind of address some of those questions, I'll be typing them into the chat box if they've come directly to me, um, just so we can continue the conversation if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you, Bella, for joining us. And we are going to move on to Teresa Lyons, and she's going to first talk a little bit about federal foundations, uh, which is more than just funding. And then she's going to talk a little bit about pre-petition removal and preliminary hearings. Teresa? Video. Uh, it was a little touch and go there. The first thing to remember is that federal foundations are there for a reason. They're there to ensure that the department is meeting specific requirements before a child is removed or a CPS case starts. And of course, the first one, if there is a removal, a court, not the department, has finding that it's contrary to the welfare to and made in the first order that removes the child from the home or the or the child cannot receive federal funding during um, his or her um, 
entire stay in foster care. So it's important that the contrary to the welfare fund be made, and it shouldn't just be a recitation. It sh it really should be fact specific based on the case. So, if you want to go to the next slide, the next slide is reasonable efforts, and you heard Bella talking about that. This is a little. This slide is a little. This finding is a little more forgiving. The department is supposed to show reasonable efforts to prevent removal unless there's an emergency situation. It only has to be made within 60 days of the removal. And on top of that, if the court finds that there's no reasonable efforts, then that can be cured later on. The court can make a finding and that will open the pipeline again, so to speak. And I also want to just mention Family First, uh, the Family First Prevention Services Act. And what that does is that allows the department to receive federal or a program to receive federal funds for prevention services. So the department is able to fund things like mental health services or substance abuse treatment without a without a removal. And in that case, then there's a prevention plan that's entered and it really helps families and it helps the department to avoid disruptions. I think we're just seeing the beginning of family first programs, not the, we're certainly not ending. Um, it's relatively new as changes in the law take time to implement. So, but be aware of it. So with regard to pre-petition removals, again, if a child is in the presence of a department worker and they're in imminent danger, then the worker does not have to wait, leave the child in the home, go get an order, and then come back and remove the child. The, the worker can take the child right then, but then they have to forthwith appear before a magistrate who's designated as a juvenile referee or a judge. So who can initiate an abuse and neglect case? The DHHR most typically is the entity that will initiate such a case. However, any reputable person can do that. If a reputable person that files an abuse and neglect petition then the department becomes the real party in interest and is required to provide services in a case. So again, it's prosecuted in the name of the department or they're the real party, although somebody else can initiate the case. Now, co-petitioning is a feature that's unique to West Virginia law, and it was designed to help domestic violence victims so that they would not be in danger of le losing their children if they were completely an innocent victim. However, the co-petitioning statute, really not statute, but in the rule, it's rule 17, it indicates that it's not limited to domestic violence victims. Grandparents can do it. And again, there's specific procedures for co-petitioners. Other parties to the case are parents, guardians, or custodians, and any other person that's basically providing care to the child. Um, with regard to children, the children are all named if they're in the home for whom if relief is being sought for that for the children, and that's in the statute. Now, are all children removed? And this came up recently in a case this year. I thought that this was a settled question. Even though abuse or neglect can 
be directed at only one child, all children are removed. And that's a little bit different state to state. So that is the, that's you name all parties. Now, with regard to if you file a petition first and do a removal after the petition is filed, the petitioner, DHHR worker usually presents the petition to the circuit court judge and they do it ex parte. The court makes that initial contrary to the welfare finding and then can either authorize or not authorize the removal. And it's important to remember that there can be non-emergency petitions. I've heard it termed general petitions too, if there's no emergency taking of the child, if the child is not removed. Teresa, we actually had a question that might be a good place for here, if you don't mind. So a question was, how does a petition for ratification of emergency custody um, differ from a child abuse neglect petition? So in other words, can you have a 90 day out of home safety plan without the filing of a child abuse and neglect petition? No, you cannot have a filing. It's it. If children are removed, then the depart the onus is on the department to go ahead and file a petition, and that's within three judicial days. So you cannot have a 90 day out of home safety plan and not have a petition. Okay. Thank you. So there's some things that are included in a petition and and it seems like a lot. I've heard it referred to as everything but the kitchen sink. But it, again, it's it's worth noting what should be in a petition. Supportive services that have been provided by the department should be included, and that's relevant, of course, to reasonable efforts to prevent removal. The petition should notify parents that they may lose their parental rights in this process. Uh, with regard to then there's information that should be included by what's called the UCC JEA. And that's really the child's residence for the last five years. Um, anybody who has legal rights to the child. I would say I do not see this very often in, in a petition, but it is required and it's helpful to know because then you can get a court order. It, Paternity may have been established in a family court case or something like that. That's a good reason to go ahead and be aware of other court cases that have involved the particular children. With regard to where is the department going to put these children, the preferred placement is with relatives or fictive kin. And I heard this on the CIP meeting um, last week. It's if you don't know the definition of fictive kin, just think preachers or teachers. So that's a good way. And I thought that really catches the essence of it. Um, anyhow, there's a need to look for relatives and disclose. The department is now required to disclose within seven days and other parties can disclose with an additional additional seven days. And of course, the goal in this matter is to get children in with somebody that they know. And if there is nobody, to go ahead and let the child stay in a foster placement. So. Now, with regard to preliminary hearings, there's some things to keep in mind. If there's been a removal, then the hearing has to be scheduled within 10 business days and or judicial days and give parties five days notice. So that, and the reason for that is so that counsel can get ready, meet with their client, explain the process and go ahead. If the first hearing, if there's been no removal, you don't do a preliminary hearing, then you, do adjudication and that's with at least 10 days notice. Now, there's some considerations and findings to consider at the preliminary hearing. Of course, the first one is, was there imminent danger to the child? 
is it was it contrary for the child to remain in the home contrary to the welfare of the child was there any reasonably available alternative to removal or was there an emergency situation that these are the primary concerns at a prelim, preliminary hearing Another thing that should be addressed is, are there any relatives or fictive kin? This is not in the rule per se at this point, but with the recent um, statutory change, that should be addressed at some point. The court could consider whether there's a way to safely maintain the child in the home. You might want to establish visits whether they should occur or not. And you also want to look at is the child's placement for school in his school of origin? Can that child stay there? With another finding is if we go to the next slide. Um, no, next one. There we go. Now, with regard to Preliminary hearings, like many situations, you can waive or stipulate a preliminary hearing if you would like. Um, the waiver must meet the purposes of the rule. The respondent needs to be present and also understand that the next step is adjudication. The respondent should make a knowing and voluntary waiver of his or her right to a preliminary hearing. If there's any um, objections to a waiver, there should be the court resolves those and the order from the hearing should reflect that there was a waiver as opposed to testimony about the case. So I wanted to take a minute to see if there were any questions that I could answer. I know with regard to preliminary hearings, um, some judges, a few judges just do them automatically, um, whether or not there's a, a waiver and some judges will allow the respondents to actually waive. It's just a matter of local practice, but it is within the discretion of the judge to determine whether or not to actually conduct the preliminary hearing and have testimony from the DHHR worker. So, Teresa, we have just a couple of minutes left, and I think a, a topic that is important for everyone that maybe you could just touch on really briefly is when we're when Bella was talking about reasonable efforts that the department needs to make prior to removal, and certainly if counsel is looking at the idea at the preliminary hearing of what reasonable efforts should or could have been made, what are some things that folks need to look for in that area? I think you need to look at whether or not some sort of out of home, in home plan was offered with services and their services listed in CPS policy that indicate what indicate safety. You might give a person parenting. Another thing that could be another service could be safety services where as a worker, in-home worker goes in uh, over at designated times, um, parenting, any substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment can be provided, referrals to community organizations. Those all sorts of things are things that council, respondents council should ask about at the hearing and not just make it uh, a rubber stamp. I sometimes I feel like with reasonable efforts, you just uh, people are looking for the right words to be said, but maybe an effort hasn't been made. The effort that was made is not apparent. 
So Teresa, we've gotten in a couple of really good questions that are gonna put us past the time. So I'm gonna share with people that um, if you need to go, um, once you hit 1250, you've certainly met your requirement for your CLE and your CEU. We ask that you take our survey, which has the codes that you need for your continuing education. Candy has graciously posted that in the chat. We'll also send that out by email along with a copy of our PowerPoint from today that has some good information in it. But for those folks who maybe wanna stay on for a couple of minutes, um, Teresa, I'm just gonna speak with you about a couple good questions that we got in. And we really appreciate everyone joining us today. We hope that you will join us on April 16th for our session on adjudication and improvement periods. But if you want to hang on for a few extra minutes, we're gonna to touch on a, a, just a couple of questions. Um, Teresa, first, if one child is physically abused as a basis for the filing, how do you address the other children who are in the home? And I think you briefly touched upon this earlier. If only one child is physically abused, all children are still considered abused and neglected child children, and they should be removed. One is, is subject to abuse and neglect. And I think the reason and policy for that is because it is abusive to watch another child being abused. Another concern is that if a child is being physically abused by a parent, the, I think the next concern, if they did it to one child, that only that child is removed, could it happen to the next child who remains in the home? So again, in West Virginia, West Virginia law indicates that all children are removed, even if only one of them is subject to the abuse or neglect. One of our colleagues, Teresa from Lewis County has, has asked a great question. Um, can you touch on the difference between having a co-petitioner and filing against both parents and just stating one parent is a non-offending parent or an interested party? Um, and she noted typically kids are physically left, of course, with a non-offending parent. Can you help us out with that? I think the is there's not a lot of difference, but I think between a co-petitioner and an interested party. To some extent, it has to do with the department believing that the co-petitioner is joined or aligned with the department sufficiently to request termination of parental rights. Again, and some of it, I have to say, is a matter of local practice too. It depends upon, again, the prosecutor and the co-petitioner both have to agree to, to that arrangement. Thank you so much, Teresa, and thank you everyone for joining us. We hope that you have a wonderful day and we will see you on April 16th. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. To those that are still on here that are having trouble with the survey link, I will look into that and I will email it out to make sure everybody gets the proper survey link. I just wanted to say thanks. Uh oh, I just lost Rebecca. But anyway, thank you guys for doing that today. I really appreciate it. And I think it went really well and it flowed very nicely. Um, Kristen, I like the way you do the MC thing. I think it just, it's a nice <laughs> way of kind of, it not only really kind of keeps us on track, but it's just a nice way to have dialogue. And I know when I present, it makes me feel a lot better. Yeah. Absolutely. Oprah. That's what I call her. Oprah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to have somebody be the timekeeper too of where we're yeah. at in the presentation. So, yeah. so Bella, thank, thank you. you. It. Thank you. Is, was this your first time to do something like this? Yes. <laughs> you did great. You did. A, Thank you. You did a great job. So we know we have you on speed dial now that we know that. You, now that we have you. you. That, that can be dangerous, Bella. You might want to run. <laughs>
that really we really do appreciate it, Bella. Thank you so much. And thank you. Did you. A great job. And tell Kathy I said thanks for letting you do this. <laughs> I will. All right. All right, you guys enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I just waved to you and realized my camera's not on. <laughs> thanks. Well, thank please you. Wave back. How about that? Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right, Christy, see you later. Kristen, I just sent you another question. So about um, that is now required. So I thought from prior trainings that is now required for the other parent to be a co-petitioner. I don't know if Teresa. What do you mean the other parent? I think she's saying that um, instead of just naming them like an interested party or a non-offending parent, that she thinks that that person is required to be a co-petitioner. Nobody, ca nobody can be forced to be a co-petitioner. And that was really because it was designed for domestic violence victims. And the concern was that somebody might be forced into taking a position they didn't want to take. And certainly co-petitioning isn't used enough, I would say. However, the general, you have to consent to be a co-petitioner. Absolutely. And, and, and counsel, if counsel for interested parties can always ask to have somebody designated as a co-petitioner opposed to an interested party. And I think that's sometimes helpful to do. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.